Well, the alternative is recognising you've got a flawed system. I think one of the great weaknesses of the human species is we have this belief of a perfect world and you find it in every, you know, every, every, every culture has its Valhalla. Every society has this you know, ideal world where everything happens perfectly, you know, but the Garden of Eden, et cetera, et cetera. It's something in our psyche to want something perfect. And what economic theory, neoclassical theory promised was a perfect world on this planet. So you, you get sucked into this belief in perfection. And what Minsky is saying is get used to it. The real world is not a porcelain doll. Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, where you get to hear from the best minds in Bitcoin and crypto. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and this week I have an interview with economist Steve Keen, who is the author of Debunking Economics and Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? We discuss the inherent problems in capitalist systems and why he thinks Bitcoin will fail. And if you want to support the show, please head over to the support section of my website, which is www.whatbitcoindid.com, and you can see all the ways you can help. Okay, on to the interview with Steve. I hope you enjoy it. Hi there, Steve. How are you? Very good. My technology finally in order. Yeah, we did. So my podcast is about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And I often have people with some kind of economics background on the podcast who are usually pro Bitcoin. But somebody came to me recently and said, I need to speak to Steve Keen because he has a much broader opinion on what's going on in the economy. And you've also been starting to talk about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as well. Mm -hmm. So welcome to the show. But for people who don't know you, could you please give a bit about your background? Well, I could describe myself as an anti-economist. I'm a professor of economics and I've been a critic of the mainstream since I was uh, 18 years old when I led a student revolt at Sydney University over the, the teaching of economics there, a successful student revolt. And uh, my basic background is I'm working in complexity theory, nonlinear dynamics, building models of the economy as a, a complex system. And I've got a strong history, so a strong background in history of economic thought and knowledge of uh, economic analysis over time, courtesy of writing a book called well, not courtesy, I've led to writing a book called Debunking Economics. So that's uh, probably my main uh, claim to the academic notoriety. And I was somebody who I was, I was calling the financial crisis before it happened in 2007. And you won an award for that, right? The Revere Award? Long story, yeah. It's, um, there's a group called the World, World Economic uh, Review that was formed roughly in 2000 as a follow-on from a student protest in France about what they call post-autistic economics. Uh, typical French, they had no idea how to carry on the political campaign, but an American uh, PhD student at mature age living in England called Edward Fulbrook made, put it on and carried it going forward. The first thing he did was uh, to devise a dynamite award for the economists that had done the most to blow up the global economy. That, of course, went to Alan Greenspan. And, uh, and then subsequently, we talked about a, a, a version, another one, uh, to re recognize those who called it. And we ultimately, I'm part of the, the committee, but I wasn't part of the voting process, obviously. And we called, we called that the Revere Award. And we had three winners to three by popular acclamation, effectively. And it came out of myself, Nuriel Rubini, and Dean Baker. And Nuriel has been vocal about cryptocurrencies recently. He had his. <laughs> he makes me look polite. He does. Nuriel, he... Nuriel, Nuriel, I like Nuriel. We're good friends. Uh, we don't see each other very often, but uh, we both appreciate each other's work. But uh, he doesn't hold anything back, does he? He certainly doesn't. And <laughs> the, the shame is, is that he's so aggressive in his opinions that actually some of the things he says are incorrect and they get lost amongst things that he said are, are of value. And it mm. would be great. I think it'd be great for him to come on one of these Bitcoin podcasts, but he seems to not want to engage. He'd probably be willing. Now, he's actually, I um, mean, he's, he's a decent bloke. He just, uh, I mean, you know what it's like. There's a, there are, every, every institution on the planet gets its trolls. And uh, he's been trolled by enough Bitcoin uh, advocates to uh, basically tar the entire universe with it, the same brush. But if you come along and say, look, I'm human, I have a decent conversation, uh, he'd quite be, probably be quite willing to have a chat. Well, maybe you can facilitate that one to happen then. Cause yeah, yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind. Just let me know and I'll pass, pass a note to him. So you did predict the crisis of 2008, but at what point did you realise there was a problem? How far back did this go? Well, I mean, the, 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 the long answer is back to the middle of 1992 when I was doing my PhD and my 
uh, my PhD was trying to build a mathematical model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And I'd successfully did that sometime in 1992. I, I wrote my first paper about it, which uh, in August of 1992, and I submitted that to a journal for various reasons It took three years to appear. But that was um, Minsky's fundamental question is, why has it not happened again? It being the financial crisis of uh, the Great Depression. And if it hasn't happened again, you know, what are the elements of the of the uh, post-war period, he's, he's writing in 1982 when he wrote this, that means we haven't had a crisis. So why did we have one in 1990 in 29 Why had one not occurred by 1982? And he said, to answer this question, it's necessary to have a model of the economy which can generate depressions as one of its feasible states. Now, that rules out the complete, completely rules out conventional economics, neoclassical theory. They, they literally enforce the belief that there's a return to equilibrium at all times in their models, even though they're mathematically their equilibrium of the model is unstable. Um, so that they just completely leave out the financial sector. Uh, they, they assume a stability of the economy. You can even see that the way they write about it right now, they're talking about including the financial sector and they talk about financial frictions. As far as I'm concerned, the financial system is a lubricant, not a friction. We, we can go to some interesting analogies there. So I built this model in 92. And the most remarkable feature about it was that it did generate the possibility for a, for a Great Depression. But the most remarkable thing about it was that it, before the Great Depression occurred, it generated what was later called a Great Moderation. In other words, if you look at the cycles in employment and a proxy for inflation, which I had in that model, they diminished before the crisis hit. And that was not a prediction of Minsky's. It was uh, Minsky did talk about stability as destabilizing, but he didn't say before the crisis occurred, everything will start to look better. Uh, that's in fact what happened in the model, and it turned out to be a. It was a manifestation of a thing called the uh, Homo Manville route to chaos, which was first discovered in fluid dynamics uh, back in the 1960s, and it turned up my economic model, and that's what I finished my my statement, my academic paper on it. So I was aware that a period of apparent moderation was actually a bad sign, not a good one. That was the long background, and then for various reasons, I, I wrote a book called I "Wrote Debunking Economics in 2000 and 2001." became completely consumed with finishing, well, not in 99, 2000, really, came consumed with fighting, fighting the neoclassicals over some of my critiques of neoclassical theory for the next four years. And when I was about to get down and, and write my uh, sort of a, my magnum opus on economics at the time, if you like, um, by sheer chance, I got asked to do an expert witness on predatory lending in Australia. And in writing my expert witness case, I was only had nine days to get it done. My mistake, I thought I had two weeks. I had nine days. And in writing it, I made this throwaway line about how the private debt to GDP ratio had been rising exponentially. And then as an expert in the Australian case, you're actually, even though you're paid for by one of the sides, you're employed by, technically, the court. So you can't use hyperbole. Anything you say must be supportable by evidence or you can't say it. So I thought, well, I have to strike the word exponential out. I'll check the data and see what it's like. I hadn't looked for several years, about six years, in fact, since I'd last looked at the data. And when I looked at the data for Australia's private debt to GDP ratio in 1963 through to 2005, it fitted a simple exponential with a correlation coefficient of 0.9912. And I said, well, so much for about the need to remove the word exponential, but holy shit, what's going on here? What's the American data like? That's the only other one I could find rapidly. That gave me a correlation coefficient from 1952 to 2005 of, I think, about 0.97. And I said, holy shit, there's a crisis coming. Um, somebody has to warn about it, at least in Australia, I'm that someone. So I, I got on the airways the next day, uh, courtesy of my good friend in the ABC, Stephen Long, who'd been ha hassling me for, for months to say something about private debt in Australia. And I simply said, look, I don't have the data. I rang up the next day and said, let's talk. And is it all forms of private debt or was the main catalyst mortgage debt? Uh, it's all forms of mortgage debt, but the mortgage debt is the ice cream, very thick layer of ice cream on the cake. You can get a financial crisis just out of corporate debt. And we had that back in 1987, when you look at the fluctuations in Australian corporate debt and American for that matter, of course. But what happened after 1987 was it, Pretty much globally, but certainly America and Australia, the data sticks out like a sore thumb. The banking sector had pushed as much debt as they could manage onto the corporate sector. And even though the corporate sector gets caught up in euphoric expectations with, you know, uh, lunatics like Alan Bond being a classic instance of that, he's dead now, isn't he? I don't know. 
I think he's still alive, but you know, <laughs> I'm not sure. Anyway, Alan Bond, Christopher Scase, he's definitely gone. So even though you get Ponzi type behavior personalities in business and Ponzi type uh, euphoric expectations as well, generally speaking, the business sector is making a calculation about further future cash revenues, and there's a limit as to how far they go. Uh, literally, as soon as Australian banks, as, you know, the 80, the Australia had a recession back in '89, starting in '89. And literally, as soon as that recession began, against my expectations, that's when the banking sector started to take off its lending to the household sector and mortgage debt. So I thought you know, they'd take a couple of years to get over the shock. Uh-uh. As soon as they couldn't lend a bond in case anymore, they're out there hawking it to the to the mortgage sector. So what you had was from that point on, in this like Australia's case, mortgage debt, household debt was something of the order of 25 or 30% of GDP. It went to, and now, as we know, 120% of GDP because households get caught up in believing house prices will rise forever. And that doesn't give you the same limitation that the business sector has ultimately of where's the cash flow coming from. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, look, I'm going to quote you now then, relating to that. Mm. Because what you said in 2008, what you said about 2008 is that in 2008, conventional economics led us blindfolded into the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression. Why does this happen? Why, where are the flaws in the current economic models and how is this allowed to happen? Who benefits from it? It isn't even who benefits. It's who's stupid enough not to think about the real causes. I mean, nobody benefited from the model of, uh, of Ptolemaic astronomy, okay? There wasn't somebody making a fortune out of epicycles, uh, but there was an entire intellectual priesthood de- dedicated to building extremely complicated models of the universe, assuming the Earth was almost the centre, um, of the universe and that all the planets and and uh, and stars and the sun and moon orbited the earth on perfect circles, which occasionally were perfect circles on perfect circles, et cetera, et cetera. You spent one and a half millennia developing stuff like that and some bastard called Copernicus comes along and tells you you're actually wrong and earth is not the center, it's actually the sun that's the center. You're going to persecute him. Now, the same thing applies in economic theory. They began in the 1870s mainstream economics began effectively as a counter movement to Karl Marx because Marx had turned the previous classical school of economics into a critique of capitalism rather than a defense of capitalism against feudalism, which is the way it was used by Smith and Ricardo. So we use an underground thing called, uh, back in those days, it, was, it was, didn't actually have a name, but we call it neoclassical economics today. That took over in a matter of a decade and they developed mathematical models of the economy reaching equilibrium back then. And that became the mental structure for for mainstream economics ever since. They've actually lost, they don't have any real knowledge of their own history, but that's where it came from. Now, as part of that, to make it easy, so they thought, to work out how equilibrium might be achieved in a a whole range of markets at once, uh, they decided to leave out the complication of the monetary sector. Now, in fact, it turned out to be impossible to prove what they wanted to prove, that these markets would actually reach equilibrium through a atonement process, but they stuck with the abstraction, so-called, of living out the banking sector. And it started coming back through sheer realism in the 1920s, 1910s and 1920s. So a range of orthodox economists, including, for example, Pigou, who was actually the guy that Keynes critiqued in the general theory, he understood that banks created money. Irving Fisher learned that the hard way. Uh, it was widespread knowledge. And after the Second World War, uh, the American economies, economists in particular reinserted the old barter knowledge where, where banks don't matter and they built models where banks are effectively what they called intermediaries, not actually originators of, of loans and money, but uh, intermediaries between borrowers and, and, uh, and savers. And they've driven away any consideration of the financial sector. So their models, including the ones which you know, the absolute halcyon, you know, we've finally got the Anspans model of the, of the capitalist economy, they completely left out money, banks, debt, and non-equilibrium processes. Now, you leave that stuff out, you can't see anything coming. So that's, that's, that's what, but what, in terms of what they benefited from, they dominated the profession. Right. They still do. So their benefit was that they were the, economic, the, the, the recognized priests of economics. Uh, the financial sector benefited quite nicely because what they were effectively saying was, don't look at the financial sector, don't have to worry about that. Well, that suited the financial sector just fine. And they also benefited from all the deregulation proposals that the financial sector put forward. Economists were completely in favour of that because, of course, getting rid of regulation makes systems work better. 
Um, so the benefit was indirect rather than direct. So, for example, obviously I'm based in the UK. Mm -hmm. So when Margaret Thatcher deregulated the, was it the mortgage market? Yeah, that's really quite important, dramatically so in the case of the UK. I was, I was stunned when I first saw the data for, uh, for the UK uh, house private debt levels. It's, it's quite shocking. Can you explain what deregulation of the mortgage market meant for the economy and therefore what the impact was? Yeah, well, in the, in the UK's case, you mainly had what are called building societies, uh, uh, financing people borrowing money to buy a house. And building societies are actually intermediaries. So a building society is an institution that will be formed in some local area, let's say Manchester, and um, it'll be have a pool of people who put their money in and the money goes into term deposits, which are stored in a the bank. They're not stored by the bank buildings, buildings society itself in its own accounts. It's not allowed to have deposit accounts. So you put your money in, you lose access to it for some time, but you know that's the case and you get paid an income interest stream out of it. The building society then lends out to people again in the local area to build a property. And what that means is you have put part of your money aside, which you hope you know, you're doing it to get the interest rate return or you're hoping to buy a house yourself later down the track. Uh, you've lost access to that money for a defined period of time. You don't have the, um, the well, the, bank, the banks have, you know, there's no act call deposits for a building society. You can pull your money out, but it's complicated. And you get a check drawn on the bank that the building society banks at rather than cash from the building society itself or a deposit transfer from the building society. So no money is created. That's absolutely essential. Then when Maggie deregulated the mortgage market in 1982, that let the banks into it. And what the banks do is you come along with the idea, I'd like to buy this property in Manchester. Let's go back to Manchester prices in 1982. And they say, well, you know, I want 50,000 pounds to say that's a good place in Manchester. And the bank says, that's a great idea. Here's 50,000 pounds we're putting into your deposit account. Simultaneously, we record an asset for ourselves. You owe us 50,000 pounds. And what that's done is that creates money. Okay, so your demand for the, for the house is not coming from somebody else having less demand by putting their money aside, not being able to buy anything. Uh, you've added to demand and the person you buy that place off gets 50000 in newly created cash, partly which they'll put back into the asset market themselves to buy a property somewhere else, partly they'll use to go shopping and furnish their new property. Uh, but what you get is a positive feedback between the level of mortgage debt and the level of house prices. And that's when... Uh, you know, that's when the, the ship was cast aside from its moorings uh, in 1982. And it's incredible when you look at the data, just what that did, because at the time Maggie uh, did that particular change, the level of private debt in the UK was roughly 55% of GDP. Wow. And its peak level between 1980 and 1982 was 73% of GDP. Uh, by the time Tony Blair and, and friends lost office, it was 193% of GDP. That's insane. Nothing, I mean, America had these ups and downs all the way through its history, going back to right as far as I can take it back, which is 1834. But the UK, uh, which was data which was assembled by the Bank of England after the crisis, showed that the peak level of private debt had never exceeded 73% of GDP between 1880 and 1980. And then when Maggie comes along, 79, she's elected, all the deregulations take a while. The big one, was the, in my opinion, was the mortgage one in 82, not the big bang in 86. And from that point on, bang, it just got an incredible increase in the level of, uh, of, government, of private debt. I'll send you a, a chart to, to back that up. It's, it was gobsmacking. It's, I mean, it's still the most amazing chart that I've, I've built to show uh, the credit dynamics of a capitalist economy. And this is why we're now at a stage where many young people can't even afford to buy a house because the house yeah. prices have accelerated so much. Yeah, my good mate, Josh Collins, Josh Ryan Collins has put a book out on that called Why Can't I Afford a House? And highly recommend that. It's a very short read by Polity Press. In fact, I've got a copy <laughs> over in my table over there. I'll, um, I'll wave it in front of the camera later for you to have a look at. Wow. Okay. So you also said that little has changed since the crisis of 2008 and the US is potentially heading for a new financial crisis in 2020. And one of my previous guests talked about a potential bond crisis. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a similar potential threat? No, I don't. Um, I, my characterization of what happens after a financial crisis depends on what happens to the level of private debt. And if you, if you have sustained high level of private debt, 
after a crisis. And the crisis is caused by the rate of change of debt, which is credit. That's what creates new money. So a new loan creates new money and people then spend that new money. So the new money causes new demand as well. You get an economy dependent upon a high level of credit-based demand. In the UK, in America's case, which is the one I know best, uh, the peak level of credit was roughly 15% of GDP. So you imagine that much of a boost to demand above and beyond the turnover of existing money. By 2010, that was minus 6%. Okay, so you had a, over a 20% turnaround. That was, not, that was not the largest. The largest was Spain, which went from plus 40% to minus 20%. Now, what that gives you an enormous fall in aggregate demand, which starts off in asset markets normally, cascades through the whole economy, causes a total slump. And in the aftermath, people are trying to pay their debt down. But what I call Fisher's paradox can apply, and that is that as you pay the debt down, as much as it was creating new debt creates additional demand as well, along with additional money, paying existing debt down destroys demand and destroys money. So if you're trying to reduce your ratio of private debt to GDP, by simply paying the debt down directly, you also reduce the denominator as well as the numerator. And in the Great Depression, that's actually what caused the debt blowout in the 1929 to 1932, because the rate at which people were paying credit down was of the order of 10% per annum, but the rate GDP was falling at was as high as 25% per annum. So if you look at the, the ratio of private debt to GDP in America in the Great Depression, it went dramatically up from 30 to 32, 33, while the level of debt was falling. Right. Now, what happened after that, it's a, it's a long story, which we'll get into, I'm sure. Uh, but that means that just relying upon bankruptcy processes or debt repayment processes can actually make a debt deflation worse. Now, in the, in the case of the America, because such a huge stimulus was thrown at the economy, twice the scale of, actually three times the scale of what's called the New Deal back in the 1930s, uh, that huge boost in demand meant people stopped deleveraging. So in, America, in America's case in 19, oh, sorry, in 2005, or 2007, the level of debt was about 160% of GDP. Given the momentum of the lending, it peaked at about 170% in 2008, 2009. It's since fallen to 150%. Now, that's, not, that's still well and truly near the maximum level the country's ever carried. So what you have is in the aftermath, uh, the debt stopped, stopped falling. People are borrowing money once more in America. Credit demand is positive again but it's positive at a relatively low level. So it's, I think it peaked at about 7% of GDP and it's currently now about 5% of GDP. So what you get is you don't have, if you're going to have a crisis, you've got to jump off a very big cliff. And the big cliff is how fast credit's growing at the time and how high, up you, how, how high the debt ratio is as well. In America's case, the debt ratio is still high, but the actual little cliff they're jumping off is quite small of the order of 5 or 6% of GDP. So if you go back into deleveraging again, you're not going to have a 21% fall in demand. You're going to have a fall of, of the order of, say, 10% of demand. That's still significant, but it's not a crisis on the scale of 2007. Right, okay. And too much private debt is a problem also because it creates inequality? That's one of the things which is completely, again, an, an emergent property of the model that I built back in 1992. Because what I added to I took a model which was a model of an economy of just capitalists and workers done by Richard Goodwin back in 1967. And I added into it effectively bankers by having debt, which capitalists would borrow, borrow money to finance building factories. So it was all productive investment, but it meant I had the third social class and the third social class makes its money by charging interest on the level of debt. What turned up as an emergent property of that model was that even though I had capitalists being the ones who were borrowing the money and borrowing it specifically to invest, so it wasn't, it wasn't you know, Alan Bond and Christopher Scase uh, speculative behavior. It was genuine, proper investment behavior. Even though the capitalists were doing the borrowing the money, it was workers who paid for it in terms of a lower income share. This is what's called an emergent property of a complex system. It's quite simple. And I finally worked it out and I wrote it up in my book, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? Totally verbally. And that is you have a system which is driven by the rate of profit. The rate of profit determines the level of investment. Even if you feed in a very stylized idea of a linear relationship between the rate of profit and the level of investment, it tells you, let's say, let's say a level of profit, say, of like a 7% rate of profit, which might be a, a 20% share of, of GDP going to capitalists. That's the level at which capitalists are willing to invest everything they earned. Above that, they invest more than they earn, so they've got to borrow money. Below it, they invest less than they earn, so they can pay some of their debt off. 
that's your point of reference. So your economy will get back to a, a set rate of growth, a set level of investment at that point when you return to that, let's say 20% of GDP being income for capitalists. So you start in a slump, in a slump, capitalists aren't investing, workers' share falls, bankers' share is being reduced as well if capitalists can afford to pay their debt down. Then when their share gets past the 20% of GDP level, they start to invest more than they're earning. They start ultimately causing a boom. They're also causing themselves to have to pay more money to bankers to finance the debt they've taken on. Ultimately, the boom hits. You have, in my model, you just have increasing wage costs. In the real world, you have increasing raw materials costs as well. Bankers' costs are also going up because you're paying interest on a rising level of debt. That gets to the point where the capitalist return falls below that 20% level, well below. They stop investing. The economy slows down. Workers start to get lower, higher unemployment, lower and lower wage change coming out of that. You pay your bank debt down a bit, but by the time you get back to the stage where the share of income has risen for capitalists back to that 20% mark, wages have fallen as part of GDP, but you haven't got rid of the debt you accumulated, all of that debt. So the debt level rises, and the next time you go into a boom, you've got a high level of banker's share, the same level of capitalist share, and a lower level of worker's share. Now, you repeat that process by several booms and slumps, and you finally get to the point where you have a crisis like we had in 2008. So a fundamental part of this process is rising inequality with more of the money going, the economy's money going to bankers and less going to capital, to workers. Capital is getting much the same level until the crunch hits because at that stage, reduction in wages and reduction in raw materials costs is more than outweighed by the exponential rise in debt servicing. And you have a crisis like we had back then. But yeah, rising inequality was actually an essential part of the model uh, in terms of how I built the, the model. And it was not something, again, that was in Minsky's theories, verbal theories. And are those problems then compounded with quantitative easing in that it's given more money to the companies to invest and inflating the valuation of shares and companies beyond what they deserve? Totally. And yeah, I wrote a piece about two years ago, um, which I'm happy to share with your readers, called The Faustian Bargain of Quantitative Easing, because Imagine what you've got here, the crisis hit, and literally I've spoken to central bank chief economic staff, and actually the chief economist, is, the chief economist happens to be a good friend of mine, and the Bank of England, and a few of the others around the world. They had no damn idea the crisis was coming. They're completely surprised by it. They thought they understood the economy, and they thought it was looking fantastic for 2008. Crisis hits them in the, in the nether regions. Uh, it's a complete shock. They have no idea of what to do. So they... And they don't even know why the crisis occurred. They're blaming the wrong factors. If they have, they'll blame the financial sector because you couldn't not blame the financial sector, but they'd blame uh, intermediation costs and all this sort of crazy stuff rather than the level of credit. So they, they did the one thing they knew how to do, which is throw money at the financial sector. Because if you think about the relationship a central bank has with the real economy, you and I don't have a relationship with the central bank. Um, in the American economy, American uh, uh, legal system, they actually prevent the Federal Reserve having any accounting relations with the non-financial sector. There was a loophole and that was actually eliminated by Glass-Steagall. So the people that they have bank accounts for are financial institutions. So the one place they can pump money quickly is into the financial institutions. And their theory was, if we pump the money in, um, that will boost share prices, that'll cause what they call a wealth effect. And the wealth effect would then mean the economy booms. So the rising asset markets will counteract the decline in the economy. Now, that was really great news for us, if anybody who owns shares. Shithouse news for those who don't. Uh, and they always say, look, we're a share-owning democracy these days. That's total crap. Uh, the ownership of shares is massively concentrated. So you take the top 5% of the population, you've got 90% of the share ownership or something of that nature. So if you boost share prices, you're boosting the top, 90, top 5% of the population. And the more extreme you get, the more you're boosting them. So it added to the inequality that was already caused by the boom that led to the crisis in the first place. And therefore, this inequality is probably leading to societal problems. And actually, do you think the Brexit vote and the election of Trump is a reflection on this social inequality? Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. And again, I make a lot of these cases in, in my um, debunking economics as well, because what you have is, is a system which 
according to the model that the neoclassical economists build completely leaves power out of the process. So the model that they call perfect competition, all these non-pejorative words they use to describe their models, perfect this, optimal that, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect competition has no power. Okay. And a, a worker is just as strong as an employer in the bargaining process to determine a wage. Total nonsense, but that's what they what they build. So they've left power out completely. Now, what and what they're trying to do is they're trying to turn the real world into a, into the into a model of the built on their textbooks because they believe the textbooks describe a perfect world which gets rid of government, gets rid of trade unions, maybe gets rid of monopolies one of these days, and that's going to be a better place for everybody. And in fact, in the real world, what it means is workers get screwed, manufacturing moves offshore. Uh, countries like the UK, which fall for this stuff, get completely deindustrialized. Third world countries do pretty nicely out of it sometimes. Uh, but what you get out of that is a resentment of the ex working class and the ex middle class for being shafted by the system. And if you get come along and tell them, look, if you don't vote, if you vote for Brexit, you'll lose all this. And they look around and say, I could lose all this. Yeah, that looks like a good idea to me. All right. So, well, do you know what's quite interesting as well? Because I did have a read of your article the one based on minsky's uh, work oh yeah finance and economic breakdown yes and i will share that out in the show notes it's a long read i probably need a couple of days to really digest it in detail and ask you but what was quite interesting that came out was something that you quoted that minsky said that capitalism is inherently flawed it has to have flaws to function as a capitalist system therefore what is the alternative well, the alternative is recognizing you've got a flawed system. And this is one of the, I think one of the great weaknesses of the human species is uh, we have this belief of a, of a perfect world and you find it in every, you know, every, every, every culture has its Valhalla. Every society has this, you know, ideal world where everything happens perfectly, you know, the Garden of Eden, et cetera, et cetera. It's something in our psyche to want something perfect. And what economic theory, neoclassical theory promised was a perfect world on this planet. Okay. So you, you get sucked into this belief in perfection. Now, what Minsky is saying is get used to it. The real world is not a porcelain doll. The real world's going to have pimples. So in the, in the case of um, the financial sector, what Minsky actually said, if you elaborate that quote, he said was capitalism inherently flawed, being prone to booms, slumps, and crises. These flaws are due to characteristics a sophisticated capitalist economy must have. Such a system will be capable of generating signals that induce an increased desire to invest and of financing that investment. And that's the real link. So you want capitalists, you know, the good thing about a capitalist system is innovation and change. You want them to want to be investing. When they do it, you know, the income distribution signal will change to make it worth their while or looking like worthwhile to invest. They'll get euphoric about those expectations, as Minsky argued. They'll extrapolate forward good times and see fantastic times in the future. Uh, and then to do it, they've got to borrow money. And they borrow money, they accumulate debt. And the process of both borrowing money adds to demand, accumulating the debt adds to a lock on the system. But when that income distribution turns against them again, they've accumulated additional debt and you're in, you could be in a serious crisis. So you recognize that mechanism exists and you say, what are the mechanisms we add counter it? Has globalization made this more of a complex problem to solve? It almost feels like any large Western government heading into a financial crisis means all large Western governments likely will. And therefore, it feels like they're almost all playing a game of chicken. Yeah, I mean, it does help because one of Keynes's not recognized statements was once to say, and above all else, let finance be national. In other words, he did not want to have international transmission mechanisms that could transmit a, a, a crisis in one country to other countries or transmit euphoria in one country to other countries. And that's exactly what we've got. We've got a system where um, you know, banks operate on a global, global footing. That means that the contagion of you know, the American bubble, the subprime bubble, spread through the entire planet because people were buying CDOs and CDSs and everything else globally. And then when the American system collapsed, even if there wasn't a, a comparable bubble in other countries, and of course, in many cases, there was a comparable bubble again because of that sharing of expectations and the the feedbacks and from the many the monetary factors are linking many many economies together. But that contagion can cause a collapse. So you, the the first company to go under was British, was the AIG. Okay, that was that had bought so many of the the of the CDOs, had them on their on their books. Uh, they were the suckers of the big short. 
So what you get is, an, a, and be, you can't clean that out easily. You get a total mess. And as a result, uh, when the Federal Reserve did its rescues of the American financial system, it also rescued large segments of the, of the UK system and the Australian system. So it makes it even worse when you allow these uh, internationalized, deregulated finance. And the, one of the first things, one of the first reforms I'd do, which again follows in Keynes's footsteps, would be to abolish that international financial uh, links and to put in the way of that a monetary system which is non-national, not the American dollar, something like the bank or, and restrict the level of trade surpluses and trade deficits and prevent finance from becoming anything other than a national endeavour. Okay. Well, referring back to 2008, we're two days away from the 10th anniversary of the release of the Bitcoin white paper. <laughs> okay. It came out. 31st of October, 2008, my 30th birthday. Happy birthday. Well, in a couple of days, I'm going to be 40. So kind of depressing, but... Uh, Maybe unhappy birthday. Well, I'll, I'll be out in Vegas, so hopefully I can have a good time. But it was seen as a response to the financial crisis. I've looked through some of your work, and it seems like you've been talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies for some time now. And I'm going to try and focus mainly on Bitcoin yeah, sure. rather than lots of cryptocurrencies. But I do understand you've talked about your point before about you can just create new cryptocurrencies, but we'll stick for Bitcoin for now. My first question is, what is Bitcoin to you? And well, I've got a couple of questions. What is Bitcoin to you? And how has your view on Bitcoin changed over the time you've been exposed to it? Well, my initial, uh, I mean, I know that the header in the first uh, Bitcoin is, is, is about the English Chancellor announcing the second rescue of the banks uh, in sometime in 2008. So I'm aware of that historical link with criticism of the, not just the financial system as it exists, but also how it was rescued in the bubble uh, and the, the breakup of the bubble. But as soon as I looked at it, I thought this guy believes money is gold quite obvious because 21 million of them exist, 21 million Bitcoin. It's, you've got to mine it. I mean, if you know, a better analogy for gold I can't think of, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, well, it's doomed because money has never been gold. This is a, a false analogy that Austrian economists uh, get off on and that a lot of people who are hyper-capitalist in their attitudes also believe that money is gold, whether they mean it actually is or it should be. Uh, is is, a, is often a moot point, but they believe money is gold, and we and therefore all the problems that come out of fiat money, we should get rid of fiat money. Particularly, we've got to abolish that nasty thing called fractional reserve banking, which is fraud, et cetera, et cetera. And all these attitudes are built in there, and they're completely wrong. And is this because gold is a commodity, but a commodity can't be money? Exactly, exactly. And this is the the best expression of this ever written was by a wonderful uh, Italian economist called Augusto Graziani, and Augusto, Augusto stood all of about five foot nothing. You never saw a man stand taller when he gave a speech. And um, he argued that looking at the money from a sort of first principles basis, he said, what is money? So well, money, first of all, store of value, and et cetera, et cetera, stuff. But he said, can money be a commodity? He said, well, if money, money can't be a commodity in a literal sense, because if you say money is a commodity, and you're trying to model it as, as, a, as an economist, then all you've gone is saying, I've got an N commodity economy, and I've got an N plus one economy, money, commodity. I haven't actually changed the nature at all. So he said, the first thing is money must be a non-commodity. Then for it to be a non-commodity, uh, it also can't be simply credit, because if I bought that paper mug on the shelf behind you uh, by saying, here's my IOU, you might give me the mug, but there's still a the relationship between the two of us that hasn't yet been terminated. So it can't be pure credit, but it also mustn't give the person who issues it, like if it's an IOU, I can go and handing out IOUs all around the place and you know finance my life by IOUs. That effectively gives me the right of seniorage. Okay. And he said Genu genuine private sector money must not give seniorage rights. So he said the only way you can make sense of all this is that money is a promise to pay of a third party, which both the parties to a transaction accept. So if I was going to buy the mug off you, I'd, I'd make a transfer from my bank account to your bank account. Uh, that's a transfer of a promise, to, a promise for a bank to pay me, for a promise for a bank to pay you, and you accept that in complete exchange of me buying that mug off you. So money in that sense is a non-commodity. And you understand that that's the way it's a non-commodity. It, it's a triangular relationship. There are three parties to every exchange, the buyer, the seller, and the banking sector. 
And that's the correct vision of how money has functioned and does function. And Bitcoin was never built with that fund understanding. Right. So before I get into my questions on Bitcoin, because I find your perspectives on it very interesting. And actually, one of the things that I can easily do with a podcast like this is just have lots of pro-Bitcoin economists or pro-Bitcoin technologists on. But I think it's very important to have contrarian views, yeah. either to improve it or yeah. to improve our understanding or use of it. So I guess the question I have for you before I go on to into a little more detail is, are there things you like about Bitcoin? And do you see it has any role to play in the economy? We need something to challenge the the, the current existing monetary system because two reasons. We need something for transactions which is not based on credit. So I'd be in favour of any system which enabled us to have a transactional system that wasn't tied up in credit money creation at the same time. And in that sense, Bitcoin could have been something of that nature. So that's one, one positive. It's also useful to have transparency because it isn't often... I mean, the whole idea that the problem with banks is they keep bad ledgers is normally bullshit. Okay, that isn't the problem. They create too much money for the wrong reasons. That's the real problem. And and also, you we we don't write that debt off, which we should write off. Okay, we treat it to sacrosanct. So there's those two problems. Uh, once and actually, it affects me. Once in history, there's been a we, recent history. There's been a case of a bank losing its ledger. That was actually the Commonwealth Bank in Australia. They lost about I think it's all the records between two before 2012. They lost literally on a truck. The tapes just went missing in a, in a in transfer of one spot to another. No idea, we've lost the records. There was interesting arguments as to why they managed to lose all that stuff. But generally speaking, banks keep very accurate, very well-maintained, very secure ledgers. And so the whole idea that you're getting a distributed ledger uh, and making it safe by the algorithmic approach rather than a trusted third party, as if that were the main problem of the financial system, no, it wasn't. Right. Okay. So where have these myths about money come from. I've seen you present about the a lot of the beliefs within the cryptocurrency community is built on the myth of a barter system, which has never actually existed yeah. as an economic system. It's been used, but not had a whole economy built on it. So where does this come from? Uh, all sorts of places, but I'd actually blame Adam Smith. Okay. Smith began the argument, first of all, you, you, I regard Adam Smith not as the father of economics, but the bastard uncle of economics who led it astray. Uh, but one of the ways in which he was the bastard uncle was to argue that we truck and barter. He said, nobody has ever seen a dog make a trade, a deliberate uh, trade of a bone with another dog. So the tendency to truck and barter was built into, into Ship Smith's mindset. And largely speaking, he left the financial sector out of his, uh, his thinking. He was actually, interesting if he's a critic of a deregulated financial sector, he was in favour of interest rate charges and controls, and he was opposed by Jeremy Bentham. And Bentham was more extreme than Smith on wanting a deregulated financial system. So Smith was, not that he was um, sanguine towards it, but he set up a mindset in which you can imagine that money was just a veil over barter. Now, that became ossified in conventional economics. They continued running with this idea of a barter system. And Volrar came along and built a model of a, a hypothetical multi-commodity uh, marketplace where money was not used. And so those, those, in, those visions of barter and the veil of money is the way the neoclassicals think about it, are just part of the background noise everybody picks up when they wake up in the morning. And you're not even aware that it's garbage. Uh, but that, that's where the myths began. And then as people like you know, David Graeber... Uh, Felix Martin, a range of other uh, anthropologists and historians, Michael Hudson, looking at the data saying, look, there's never been a case of barter being used on a grand scale except as a ritualised process between otherwise potentially warring neighbouring tribes, which there's been some records of that, particularly in Australia and, uh, and parts of, South, uh, parts of um, oh, New Guinea and so on. Uh, and or it's been used when there's a period of total political breakdown, like the 30 years war and the 100 years war in Europe, when you no longer trusted the king you were fighting for to actually be alive the next day to pay you the, your fees as a mercenary in his currency. So you wanted payment in gold or silver. So in those isolated periods of social breakdown, that's when gold money has been, gold has been used as money or silver has been used as money. But fundamentally, it's been a unit of account 
created by the relevant political authority for the region. And that's what maintains it, not that it has a commodity backing. Right. So all money, therefore, is based on a trust system. Yeah. Trust belief, yep. trust between. So, I mean, gold isn't money, but if I wanted to buy something from you with gold at a very good value, you'd probably accept it because you would trust gold. Whereas if I offered you some new new thing that you'd never heard of, some new random cryptocurrency, you wouldn't accept it because you don't trust it. So one thing Bitcoin, I guess, has managed to do is create trust in a network of people, ironically, on a trustless system. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, it's created a system, uh, but I mean, the extent to which it's, it's let, you know, there's been breakdowns in the validity of that trust already pretty, pretty remarkable. I mean, we have rules in stock exchanges to stop to require prospectuses to be backed up by some legal discovery process. The reason is we used to not have that, and you had so many scammers, particularly back in the days of the South Sea bubble, of course, but so many people ripping off people on the basis of euphoric expectations at different points in, in financial bubbles that the, the regulations were built to try to restrain that, and it still happens. Now, Bitcoin is a wild west on that front. And yes, it's based on you trusting the algorithm, but the algorithms have never been perfect. There's always been breakdowns. There've been forks, et cetera, et cetera. And there's been plenty of fraud as well, which Nuriel, of course, really hammers you for. So people trust an algorithm, but they are that trust can be exploited in the same way that I trust in the financial sector can be exploited. Yeah, I think that is why I said at the start I would separate cryptocurrencies from Bitcoin because I feel like a lot of what Nuriel was saying were problems I would associate more with cryptocurrencies in general and less so with Bitcoin. Mm, okay. in that the most, most of the scammers or the scams that seem to happen have been in on other cryptocurrencies, either forks or ERC-20 tokens on the Ethereum platform, mm -hmm. projects where people have exited and disappeared. Now, that's not to say that people haven't created scams with Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, there was an exchange this week that did an exit called Maple Exchange, and it suspected it might be an exit scam. Mm. But there are, I guess there are different levels of fraud. There are fraudulent creation of fraudulent currencies and then fraudulent exploitation of people's use of the currency. Mm. I think they're two different things. That said, so you think it's good to have a challenge to fit and it's good that we've got an alternative. How would you like to see cryptocurrencies change or specifically what do you think would be nice to see in Bitcoin to see it become a good challenge to the fiat monetary system? Well, I don't know that Bitcoin can because that relies upon the energy cost as a way of, 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 of you know, getting your um, validation at the ledgers and then rewarding the miners. The energy cost elements are just a, a fatal flaw for Bitcoin. So I don't think, don't think it can be uh, reformed unless you dramatically reduce transaction costs and dramatically reduce the, the energy overhead in Bitcoin. But the basic idea of a, of a, of a crypto... Can we explore that? Can we explore that area? Why do you think energy cost is a fatal flaw? Oh, my God, mate. Uh, <laughs> at the moment, the energy costs of Bitcoin are close to the size of Belgium. They, they've, you know, they've fallen a bit courtesy of the collapse in the value of the, the Bitcoin. But you, you don't want to have simply transaction costs absorbing that much of your GDP to begin with. If you continue the sort of extrapolation of price people were doing before the price crash earlier this year, then the energy costs start approaching that the size of a major continent, let alone a major country. And frankly, energy is not something we can afford to be pumping into the biosphere anymore. Well, Waste energy. Of course, the, the Bitcoin fundamentally is the classic definition of entropy because all you're doing is you're, you're burning 10 minutes of processing time across the whole planet, across thousands of computers, plus all the network transactions, simply for the sake of, of verifying the system, the current system of accounts. Uh, in an energy sense, that's masses of energy in and masses of heat out the other side and bugger all physical stuff. It's massively wasteful at a time when we have to be dramatically cutting back on our energy consumption or finding a way of, uh, of reducing the damage we're doing to the biosphere. Bitcoin ain't helping global... Actually, Bitcoin is helping global warming, but in the wrong direction. Okay, let me ask a different question on that because... There is a whole debate around the energy side, and I don't think we need to have that now. I can share some articles back with you. There was a recent article yeah. produced by a guy called Dan Held looking at energy consumption for Bitcoin, and yeah. some people would argue that actually that cost of securing uh, the most trusted, 
I say, quote unquote, trusted network in the world is important. But I think your point about wasting energy when we've got a problem with global warming is an interesting point. But why is that a fatal flaw in Bitcoin's purpose? It can't. Well, it's not a flaw in its purpose. It's a flaw in its design. Okay. You cannot, we cannot be relying upon proof of, is it called proof of work? Yeah, that's it. Where, where that requires massive amounts of energy to validate the, the, the system. If you, if you get it, this is partly because of the whole focus upon not having a trusted third party, you know, and you have to have thousands and thousands of ledgers and people competing for the ones to get the reward and so on. If you made Bitcoin a cryptocurrency, which had a few hundred copies of the ledger uh, in trusted institutions, like central banks, at least in the accounting side, are deserved to be trusted, and then the private banks as well, and then have a, a, a way the public can access a copy of the ledger, which is totally anonymized, to verify that actual transactions took place, or to be able to trace to some extent uh, those transactions without them being personalized. That'd be a useful system. And I know there are some people working on ideas like that. Yeah, I think you just described something called EOS. Yep, and there's a couple of others. But I guess the problem with that with many Bitcoiners would have is that's against the fundamental decentralization side of Bitcoin, whereby most Bitcoiners want maximum decentralization. And that, you know, that's probably one of the most important aspects of Bitcoin. Like, I understand how it might be seemed inefficient to use that much energy. But at the same time, I don't see how that's a flaw in the system in terms of whether it can be a challenger to money because to me that's just an economic component of the system in that mine is mine they get a block reward they can use that to pay for it so it's just a it's just part of a the engine of the system i don't understand it's too expensive it's too expensive an engine particularly when you're talking what is it? how many transactions a bitcoin handle right now per second well okay so it does seven well it, it was seven transactions per second i think it's slightly up with segue although i'm out of my technical depth so seven transactions a system wouldn't happen there's more than seven transactions in the, per second in the street outside my window. I know. <laughs> yeah, I get that. But that's by design choice, right? We can easily... Yeah, increase. and a bad design choice. There's an easier way to increase in transactions per second by increasing the size of the block. You might you might be aware of this. Yeah, I know. I'm aware of that. Yeah, the two megabytes versus eight. So on. Yeah, yeah, and there's been a massive debate over the years. And then what was created was a fork, say, called Bitcoin Cash, which has been... It's been proven to be the false way to uh, scale Bitcoin. The best thing to do is what we have is something in layer two called Lightning Net, which I'm not sure if you're aware of. I've heard of, yeah. Therefore, Bitcoin is the settlement layer mm. and Lightning Networks becomes the way for people to transact, you know, low transaction cost and it's fast. I still don't understand, like we have Bitcoin being used now. People are using it to send value to each other, et cetera, et cetera. I still don't understand why you think the mining side is a flaw in the system. I, I almost think it's a red herring to the question I'm asking you. I, I'm like, because I'm asking you, what are the flaw? Like, wh what does Bitcoin need to do to challenge fiat? I don't, I think it can, it can work with the mining. I think it's other properties that probably are more important. I, I just, I just can't see how the mining scales. I mean, you, you're talking, you know, the, we're talking the seven transactions a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're talking that when, and we're using the energy of Belgium to finance those seven transactions a second. But why does that matter? You need 700,000 transactions a second to even approximate the demands of transactions on a planet with 9 billion people. Now, uh, if, if you can get to 100,000 times the number of transactions, you have to do it in a way that doesn't give you 100,000 times the energy consumption. Now, even if it gives you 10 times the energy consumption uh, or 100 times the energy consumption for you know, 100,000, a million times as many transactions per second, that is one hell of a, block, a blockage. And at some point, uh, if, if we start, you know, please don't tell me, you're, you, well, you can tell me, go ahead and tell me if you don't believe global warming is happening. Oh, no, I, I believe global warming is happening. I'm, I'm, I work in both fields and uh, more in economics, obviously, than I do in climate, climate type change. But... Uh, Okay, we're going to destroy the planet that way. So to have a requirement of that much energy consumption just for the sake of transactions, when there's so few transactions right now and such a huge energy demand, I simply can't see a path that gets you to pretty much 10 to the 6 times as many transactions, possibly 10 to the 7 times as many transactions, 
uh, without giving a 10 to the two or three times as much energy usage. And if, if you get, you know, either one of those happens, if you don't get the transaction scaling, it's not going to work to price fiat money. And if you do scale the energy, it's going to be banned in the next 10 to 20 years. It simply will not be allowed because it's too wasteful and too damaging for the biosphere. Now, that's, that's a Venn diagram that doesn't overlap. Well, there's a couple of points there. So uh, I think the first one is I believe global warms happen. I'm with you. I'm, I'm not a denier. Uh, I I have my concerns. Uh, and, and you, know, I, you know, but I equally, I think people should be eating less beef because I've watched Cowspiracy and I've looked at how much the beef industry has contributed contributing global warming. There are factors everywhere. In terms of the transactions per second, I think one area that might be worth spending a bit of time, like not now, I'll send you the stuff, is looking at the layers of the network. So Bitcoin is the ultimate settlement layer, which can handle half a million transactions a day, which should be more than sufficient as a settlement layer with the second layer, uh, Lightning Network, for all the much smaller transactions. That to me is like a sensible network. And that to me is, in terms of a structure, is right. With the mining, again, there'll be better people to discuss efficiencies or inefficiencies and the damage to the environment. But a lot of that rhetoric has actually been debunked. But again, it's something I'll send for you to read to challenge. I'm more interested with you in knowing what are the properties in the design of the protocol that would be good for it to challenge money? Well, it has to be able to, first of all, you have to be able to create it, to have it expand, feeding the needs of a growing system. Because again, there's been no economy on the planet that has grown with a shrinking money supply. Right, yeah. So this is this is where the, you know, and I've tried to read and understand, this is where the Bitcoiners refer to the benefits of deflation with Bitcoin, but you disagree. Totally. I mean, deflation is what gives you to go great depressions. They should take a look at the 1930s and see how wonderful it was to have falling prices back then. If you had, see, what they're leaving out is the accumulation side of a system like that. Falling prices would be fine, inverted commas, if all, all the demands on your money also fell at the same time. But if you have a the financial system we have right now, which of course is a credit and debt based system, a falling, falling amount of money does not mean a falling amount of debt. So what you get is an increasing debt burden coming out of a fall, out of deflation. Now, if they could say we're going to have falling prices and falling prices will take the place of uh, of the the money supply growing, uh, then you've got to have a system which doesn't have an accumulator like debt or doesn't give something like again like if you own if you own Bitcoin and you've got a you know a, a rising price for everything in terms of Bitcoin, which is what's going on. You know, price things getting cheaper in terms of Bitcoin, Bitcoin getting more expensive. Those who've got Bitcoin are accumulating wealth. And you get, again, the same inequality, asset-based inequality system when what people have always got in their minds about money is they think about it an income system without a wealth system attached. Like the Austrian vision of money talks about credit. They're quite aware of the existence of credit, but they completely leave out that if you have credit, which is change in debt, you've got to have debt. And then the level of debt becomes an important question in the system. The best a form of money in some ways is some money which turns over rapidly, which you're encouraged to turn over. That's the opposite of HODL, hold on for dear life, okay? Now, HODL is saying, let's hang on to this stuff and not spend it, you know, watch it going up over time. That is a fabulously bad basis for transactions. That means you're going to think, oh, should I buy that coffee? If I buy that coffee and I'm going to have a bit less Bitcoin, that means I'm going to lose this money in future, so I might not shop. So I'm going to sit back at home and I'm going to make myself a hot water uh, and I've got to put a, sh- a bit of sugar in. I mean, I'm being a bit exaggerated there, of course, but it's it's, exa- it's encouraging you not to circulate your money. Now, money is a means of circulation. And we have a whole range. Of, it's not just Bitcoin that has this problem. It's also the credit system itself. They both have the problem. They encourage you not to circulate the stuff. Now, I would have a better model for Bitcoin would have been the Wogel currency. If you go back and take a look at Wogel, which is a town in Austria that, was suffering from the Great Depression as badly as anywhere in the Austro-German area. And the, the I've forgotten how the mayor came in to be aware of, of the existence of Silvio Gazelle's ideas, but he then produced a local script which could be used to pay uh, council rates and, and so on, uh, which had to be, if you, if you didn't spend it, it deteriorated in value over time. And within a very short period, that town went from 25% or more unemployment to zero. Booming economy with the circulation of stuff until the central bank shut it down. 
Now, something that encouraged circulation would be a much better form of virtual currency than Bitcoin, and, and that could be a real rival for the system we currently have. What are your thoughts on Austrian economics? Because obviously Bitcoiners and Bitcoin maximalists are huge fans. And I've done some of my own reading and I, I, you know, I find some really interesting things in there, but I'm not an economist. I'm not an intellect that way. So I could be very easily led to believe one system over the other. I, I respect probably more the opinions of lots of different people. So what are your, what are your thoughts on Austrian economics? Well, there's a lot of things I have sympathy for in terms of the analysis of the importance of lack of information and the market as a coordination system for a world in which we do have very incomplete knowledge. Not only the, the, the we have no knowledge of the future, an incomplete knowledge of the present, and normally vague and contradictory knowledge of the past. So in that system, you can't have central planning getting everything right. And therefore, you have to, a market works as a good way, a distributed information system effectively for this make intelligent, roughly intelligent decisions uh, given very, very limited information. Now, that's a totally different perspective to the neoclassicals who literally, to, to hold the fact that their mathematics never worked, they got mathematical answers they didn't like, to get around the errors they presume were all Mostradamus or God. And they presume infinite knowledge and this nonsense about perfect knowledge and perfect foresight and all this utter garbage. The Austrians, thank God, are a resistance to that. But they still swallow the idea that capitalism approaches equilibrium. And they've still got, they've got a very primitive nitrogen even though they're aware that banks create money to some extent, uh, they've got a very primitive nature of banks and they think the money should be gold and so on. So there are all these various flaws around their, uh, some of their foundational elements. And they also have the same subjective utility theory of value that the neoclassicals have. And for reasons that are a bit too complicated to go into in this podcast, uh, ultimate, your ultimate basis of your theory of production must be objective. You must explain how we manage to turn energy into useful work. And that's completely uh, objective, empirical data. If you don't have an excess of energy out from energy in, if you don't have an energy return and energy invested, you're not going to have anything you're going to be able to put any utility to. So you've got to start with an objective theory of value, and they start with a subjective theory. Now, you have elements which are subjective and objective sitting on top of that, and I can build that out of Marx's philosophy of dialectics, which actually in some ways Hayek shares. Most people aren't aware of that. But Hayek actually had a Russian dialectical, dialectical uh, trainer in his education and a wonderful member of the Austrian philosophical community called Chris Giabra identified that for me some time ago. So there are elements, that, there are good and bad elements woven through Austrian to the extent that they share the same foundations of the neoclassicals. That's where their problems come from. Uh, but they, they, given that bad foundation, they do better with it by acknowledging we have very bad, incomplete information, uh, even about the past, let alone the present and future. And we, and the, and the market works as a coordination system for people who are groping in the blind better than a central planned one. So th those are good elements of it. The focus on uncertainty and the focus on the role of the entrepreneur, I think they're all important. So lastly on Bitcoin, do you think there's a possibility that people are trying to pigeon the whole Bitcoin as a thing, like a gold or money or store of value. And actually, there's a potential that it is just something new and unique and may play out as something that does serve multiple purposes. It could, but I'm, I, I think, you know, I, I simply can't see Bitcoin surviving because I think those design flaws, there's too many of them and it's too close to the crunch time on a whole range of those. I, in the next decade, I think we're going to go into energy rationing. Right, okay. Even Donald Trump will have to consider that if he's still alive. 71-year-old you know, and all that sort of jazz, suffering obviously from Alzheimer's. There's, the, the, the reality is going to bite. And when it bites, if you've got a, a, a transaction system with the enormous energy overheads of Bitcoin still, uh, then they're going to say, no, we're shutting you down. Well, I think that's one. You've got to, if you're going to go from seven transactions a second to a million transactions a second, don't start it with a with a ball and chain around your feet, which is what that actual seven transactions and ten minutes rules all all give you. Start again. So I, I think in that sense, Bitcoin. You know, there's often what they call the first mover advantage. I think Bitcoin is the first mover disadvantage because those mistakes and the fundamental mistakes and in, in in the knowledge of what money is and the design of the system on top of it are uh, enough to mean that I think it's going to fail. And but some of the other cryptocurrencies which are being developed 
as you know, I've alluded to in this conversation, they may well end up succeeding using the original ideas that come out of the wreck of Bitcoin. This has been a kind of like a real eye-opening interview to me. Just like very enjoyable. I do want to finish on one thing though. I just want to get your opinion on something, especially as I've got a 14-year-old and an 8-year-old and I think I know the kind of answer you're going to give, but what do you think of the current education system? It sucks. <laughs> In so many words. Yeah, I thought you might say that. It's, it's, I mean, the whole, we're trying to test the death out of these kids. We have dumbed down the university education drastically. Uh, so because you have far too many people going to university, they should be going to, a lot, a lot of the population that they should be going to technical colleges and getting advanced uh, training in machine tools and engineering. We, have, we should have respect for those professions rather than, only respecting somebody who walks out with a degree. Uh, at the same time, we've, we've turned universities into bureaucratic hell holes and we're doing the same to schools now in the name of making them into more like a market. And reality, what it means is you pay these people outrageous salaries to be your bosses and, and to, to what they're doing to try to work is with what you supposedly got rid of the, of the terribly inefficient public sector layer. What you've replaced it with is marketing. Now, you, you get me anybody who is willing to argue that marketing is more efficient than a public sector bureaucracy. And you've got a fight on your hands, and I don't like bureaucrats. So uh, we get the worst of all worlds out of the mess we're in right now. And um, it's a great pity because at the same time, we have technologies that many things like, make things like, um, uh, what's its name, the, uh, the mathematics teaching system on the web. Um, I've forgotten its name. But uh, there, there are beautiful ways to be able to learn without the restrictions of... Uh, of the, the, some of the backward parts of old school education and old university education, but we've completely stuffed it up with this attempt to marketize it. Yeah. This has been absolutely fascinating. Can you please tell everyone who's going to listen to this how they can get hold of you, where they can find the work you're doing, and I will share it all out in the show notes, and then also anyone you would like to hear from. Yeah, sure. Well, put it on. I'm, my, I'm, I'm pretty much leaving the university sector for a I'm actually one of the victims of the of the um, attempt to turn into a marketplace because the Brits copied a stupid idea from the Australians, uh, which was to deregulate first year student intakes in the, allegedly to make it more like a market. What it meant was the top ranked universities offered more positions in humanities uh, to try to get bums on seats because uh, humanities are cheap to teach, STEM subjects are expensive. That destroyed my university department in Australia back in 2012. The Brits did the same thing in 2013, I turned it to 2014. So it's slowly strangling the post-92 universities. My university has been forced to massively downsize shortly after I arrived at the place. So I'm now uh, becoming crowdfunded and I'm using Patreon for that. So if only people want to find my work, it's uh, www.patreon.com slash Prof Steve Keen. And uh, most of the stuff that I put there goes up for free, um, but people can sign up and and uh, support me for as little as one dollar a day and as much as they like above that and i've got about a thousand just over a thousand people supporting me right now and that means i can afford to be an independent scholar and that's fabulous freedom to i do it anyway i was you know i was a thorn in the side of mainstream economics and politics politics and so on while a university professor and but i can now continue doing it and absolutely relish in it not have any fear about Am I going to have another fight with the Vice Chancellor, courtesy of this one? This has been so utterly fantastic and fascinating in so many ways. Steve, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Okay, so what did you make of that? Did you enjoy that interview? Do you like what Steve had to say? I think it's pretty cool. I think it's well worth following him, well worth going to check out some of his articles. I've included lots and lots of them in the show notes. I think his work is very important and I think it's really good to hear contrarian views. I don't agree with him on everything. I think he doesn't understand everything with Bitcoin. It was certainly good to have him on the podcast and talk about his thoughts on both the economy and Bitcoin. Okay, so if you want to support the show, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Firstly, you can consider becoming a Patreon. Head over to Patreon forward slash what Bitcoin did. You can become a show sponsor. If you're interested in doing that, you can email me on hello at whatbitcoindid.com. I think I've hit 80,000 downloads in October, so that's a big jump from previous months. So it's grown and grown and grown. So if you want to reach a new audience, feel free to get in touch. We can talk about that. You can leave me a review on iTunes, or you can also click on the subscribe button. Both help the show. Five-star reviews if you think it deserves it. You can follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Medium. I'm on Instagram. My handle on everything is at what Bitcoin did. And if you reach out to me, I will probably have a chat to you. You can check out my website 
always making changes, always trying to make it as useful as possible. You've got all the old interviews, transcriptions. You can surf them by topic, by guest. You can find all this at www.whatbitcoindid.com. And you can also sign up to my newsletter. I started trying to do a daily one, but I've been so busy. It's too hard to do. I think I need some help, but I will be rethinking that shortly. And also you can share the show out with your friends and family. If you want to get in touch, you want to speak to me, feel free to email me on hello at whatbitcoindid.com and I pretty much reply to everyone. Okay, thank you to everyone for your continued support with the show. I'm still in Vegas, heading back to London tomorrow, so I'll see you all next week. 